Hello there, we're very happy to welcome you to our service of worship on Trinity Sunday when we celebrate the, the fullness of the revelation of God throughout time and eternity and we're glad you could join us. Um, my name is Richard McSherry, I'm the pastor of the Shaftesbury Methodist Church <clears throat> and we're glad that you could be with us today as we worship here in the First Baptist Church on Main Street of Bennington and they have very graciously um, allowed us to use their beautiful sanctuary uh, for worship. And we want to remember the words of Jesus that said, where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is in their midst. And he is in our midst today as well, with those of us gathered here and for those of you who are at home today. If you would like a, a bulletin of our service, and it has the, the service outlined, and you may want to follow that at home, you can contact us at 442-4599. That's here in Vermont, so it's 802, of course. 442-4599, and we would be very happy to make sure you do receive a bulletin. Um, in addition, um, our scripture readings, which we'll be having a little later in our service, are as follows. Our gospel reading, if you want to make a note of this, if you want to take out your own Bibles, is John chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. Uh, the New Testament reading is 1 Peter 4, 12 to 14, and then jumping ahead a little bit to chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. And our psalm reading today is Psalm 68, selected verses from Psalm 68, which Sue and I will be sharing very shortly. So if you'd like to make a note of that, and I'll be announcing the hymns as we uh, continue in our service. So let's turn to God in prayer at this time. Gracious God, King of the universe, we are so happy that we could gather together here in this beautiful sanctuary and by television to worship you, to honor you, to lift up your name. We just pray for each and every one who are here and each and every one who will be watching that you will bless them and keep them in your watch care and that you will indeed, as we heard sung, fill this place, O Holy Spirit, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, Sue is going to come forward and uh, we're going to share together um, our statement of faith. <clears throat> We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We're called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and to resist evil. To proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And our first hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Oh 
SEC Cherubim and Seraphim Falling down before thee Which word and heart And evermore shall be Holy, holy, holy Though the darkness hide thee Though the eye of sinful man Thy glory may not see Beside me, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed At this time, we're going to have our psalm reading, our psalter reading as it's referred to, and it's going to be Psalm 68. May God arise, may his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke. As wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. He is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families, and he leads out the prisoners with singing. But the rebellious live in the sun-scorched land. When you, God, went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance. Your people settled in it. And from your bounty, God, you provided for the poor. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord, to him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens, who thunders with mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the heavens. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be God. Amen and amen. We come to that time of our service when uh, we want to bring our prayers and our concerns before the Lord. Uh, we want to continue, of course, to pray for those who have been so grievously affected by this COVID-19 epidemic. We want to especially pray as places begin once again to open up and people seem to be out and about much more than they were before, that uh, God's protecting presence will be with all of us. I think that uh, the very disturbing events that we've had in this past week or so have affected all of us in one way or the, the other. And we want to especially pray for our nation, for our divided and broken and hurting nation. We want to have the peace that passes all understanding that comes through Christ. We want his presence in this situation 
and we want understanding and reconciliation for our country. We'll keep that in prayer as well as other things. Let's go to God in prayer and um, please join us when we continue, even if you're in your room alone with the words that Jesus taught us. So let's turn to him in prayer at this time. Gracious God, you are indeed the father of nations. And we remember the words of scripture, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We have experienced a very difficult uh, week this past week, and we pray, O oh God, for your presence and your peace during this week. We remember the words of the psalmist who said, Blessed are brethren when they dwell together in unity. And Lord, now more than ever, we need unity in our nation and indeed in our world. We pray, O oh God, for your peace and your presence. We pray, O oh God, for healing. We pray for reconciliation, and we pray for calm in the face of disorder. Gracious God, be with the leaders of our communities, the leaders of our, our towns and cities and state, the leaders of our nation. Help us, Lord, to listen more than we speak, to seek to understand even where we do not understand. For we ask this, God, in Jesus' name even as we pray his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 195, it's Come Thou Almighty King. this time during our service, we uh, normally take what is called the offering, our tithes and our offerings, when we give back a portion of what God has so graciously given to us. And I think perhaps a gift that all of us could give in the days and weeks ahead is the gift of understanding and listening. 
And so as you uh, continue to support through your tithes and your time and your treasure, um, think of ways that you can further the light and not the heat, as they say. And we can remember the prayer of Francis who said, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred. Let me so love. And so perhaps that can be our, our gift today and through this week ahead. Amen. This time we're going to be having our scripture readings, which again are from 1 Peter and from the Gospel according to John. The reading from the New Testament is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, and chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled because of the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of power, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert, like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And the gospel reading is from the gospel according to John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. For you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. 
and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you gave me because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I have been glorified through them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name, those whom you have given me, so that they may be united as one, just as we are one. And may God bless the reading of his holy word. Let us uh, turn to God again for prayer. Loving Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts gathered before you this day be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In our gospel reading, we find these words of Jesus when he said, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Jesus, you see, brought glory to his heavenly Father by completing the work that God had called him to, to, to do. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, we read, And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here you see God, Jesus is modeling that servant leadership role. David in the Hebrew scriptures was a shepherd king, a modest beginning for one who would lead God's people. And this prayer of Jesus in the gospel reading that Sue shared with us is referred to as his high priestly prayer. If the Lord's prayer is his prayer for us, given to us for our benefit and given to us as a model that's really what the Lord's Prayer is, a model for prayer in general. This prayer is Jesus' prayer for us. That's, that's the difference. It is the longest of any of the Lord's prayers found in the Gospel. It is longer than the Lord's Prayer, which many of us are familiar with. And Jesus prays this just after he has given the disciples their final instructions, their marching orders, as it were. And he prays prior to this, prior to his betrayal and arrest, passion and suffering, and ultimately crucifixion. Yes, this is called the high priestly prayer because it is a model that is found in the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. The role of the high priest was one of the many roles that our Lord Jesus Christ served. He had many titles and many roles. He was shepherd, teacher, king. There were many roles and one of them was high priest for us. One commentator said, the office of the high priest was instituted on Mount Sinai when God gave the law to the Israelites through Moses. Aaron and subsequently Aaron's descendants were chosen to be priests who were responsible for interceding for Israel before Almighty God. And we find that in Exodus chapter 28 and 29. One priest was selected as the high priest who would enter into the Holy of Holies. Not everyone could go in there willy-nilly. You know, that was a special place on this earth. And once a year, someone was chosen to go into that, that Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement to offer the sacrifice that would temporarily cover 
the sins of the people. When Jesus came, he offered his life as the ultimate sacrifice that would not only cover the sins of the people, but completely cleanse the people and save them. Jesus is the ultimate high priest, and his inter intercession for us in John 17 is a wonderful, multi-layered example of his divine love for each and every one of us. He is the shepherd and the sheep. He is, he is the giver and he's also the sacrifice. That sacrifice, that giving of his life, was the work that Jesus was sent to accomplish. It was the ultimate example of servant leadership. The king who gives his life for the people. And you know, we really need that example today, don't we? We really need servant leaders. We need people who are called to serve the people and to serve them by example, and by caring, all of those qualities which we might not think of in a leader uh, or leadership today are things that we desperately need on so many levels throughout our, our world and our nation and our communities. We need those kind of folks indeed. And that was a radical departure from the role of kings and leaders known in most parts of the world. Oh, the world knew and has known kings and emperors and uh, princes and potentates and dictators and invaders and all kinds of, of leaders of one kind or another. History is littered with them. But what of servant leaders? Those are few and far between, indeed. Those who lead not only in word and deed but by example are those, sadly, few and far between. It has been said that a noble leader answers not to the trumpet call of self-promotion, but to the hush whispers of necessity. A good leader sees the needs of the people and tries to the best of their ability to fulfill those needs. Jesus' mission was to glorify his Father and to rescue a fallen humanity. He saw the need of us, our heart need really, our, the deepest depths of our being. He saw that need and he met that need. Servant leadership moves beyond the promotion of self to a focus of the well-being of others. That's probably the primary definition of a leader, of a servant leader, the definition of others. And often that is done in complete anonymity. As the Bible says, when you do good, don't let your right hand know what your left is doing. You don't do it to get the medal or the plaque or whatever it might be. And that's wonderful. We should acknowledge folks, uh, even publicly. But our motivation should be other. In a speech <clears throat> given in 1940, Sir Winston Churchill, I'm sure most of you know that name, uh, British Prime Minister uh, during the uh, Second World War, praised the men of the British Air Force with a stirring phrase, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many from so few. There was Great Britain, her back to the wall, facing a powerful and menacing foe, holding on because of those who went that extra mile. Now, we don't know any of their names. Most of us have never met those who served but we, even here in this country of ours, owe them a debt, a great debt. They are truly servant leaders who laid down their lives, some of them literally laying down their lives, for others. You know, we sometimes lose that historical perspective. You know, something happened a long time ago. It's not really relevant to me now, but it is relevant and it's very important because so many have done so much for us. Jesus says something very interesting here in this prayer when he says, I am asking on their behalf. Isn't that amazing? Just think about that for a moment, just a brief moment. In spite of all that Jesus was about to face, his passion, crucifixion, betrayal, and perhaps emotionally that was the worst part. The closest people to him abandoned him. They scattered to the four winds. But before that moment, Jesus took the time to intercede with God for his followers. You know, you and I are called to be that same kind of servant leader as well. We are called to go beyond self, beyond our own needs, beyond our own desires, to serve others. Ultimately, to serve the Lord and then to serve others. So what are the characteristics of a servant? 
What's a, how does a good servant look? You know? Well, there are many. The well-being of others is paramount. In the letter to the Philippians, we read, If there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion, sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in all humility, regard others better than yourself. It's not a popular concept today to regard others as better than yourself. It's not a message that we hear. We should be concerned with, with our well-being. I think scripture affirms that. I mean, the Bible says to, to love your neighbor as yourself. So there's a healthy sense of self, but we should consider others. And a servant is one who serves. That's pretty basic. All of us have been gifted by God. All of us. And empowered by the Holy Spirit to labor for the kingdom. And we need, each and every one of us, need to prayerfully discern how we can use the gifts for the better, betterment for others. Because we have all been gifted. The Bible assures us we've all been gifted. Them. Some of them are splashier gifts than others, but each and every gift is important. A servant shows up. Sounds simple, right? Well, we need to make ourselves known by our presence. How difficult it's been for these last few weeks not to, not to show up, not to gather together. We miss that so much. I hear that again and again. And we look forward to those times when we can gather together and trusting the Lord that will be soon. We need to be present for each other and for the Lord. This is basic, but we do miss that so often at times. The author of the book of Hebrews states, let us consider how we can provoke others into love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Of course, this is a great challenge in this era of so-called social distancing. But we can still, after a fashion, gather, as it were, in front of our televisions, around our computers, on phones, whatever it might be, and in that way still continue to provoke one another. I like that word, it's very, we don't think of that as a positive word, but to provoke each other to good works for the kingdom of God, for the sake of the reign of God's kingdom on earth. That very kingdom for which we pray each and every time when we pray those words of our Savior, thy kingdom come. I like the Peterson paraphrase. Some of you might be familiar with that, his paraphrase of the New Testament called the message. And he says, so let us, full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out, let's keep a firm grasp on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps our word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring one another on, especially as we see that big day approaching. Spurring one another on, provoking one another on. This should encourage us to pray all the more diligently for that day of deliverance when we can once again gather together. A servant is one who does their very best in whatever they do, great or small. In some sense, a servant is invisible. If a servant is, say, a household servant, in that kind of classic sense, you know, everything runs smoothly, and you don't really notice that. What you notice is when it goes a little awry. A servant is one who does what they can without regard to what others may think. There was a funny story told that in the middle of the uh, American Civil War, a visitor was a guest um, in Washington. And he was a bit restless, and this guest, guest got up in the middle of the night and he began to wander around the executive mansion, and as he was doing so, he noticed a light coming from a room. And as he approached the room, he noticed that inside, President Abraham Lincoln was sitting there and very calmly polishing his shoes. He was astonished that the President of the United States would be polishing his own shoes. And he exclaimed without even thinking, he said, why, Mr. President, you polish your own shoes? To which President Lincoln answered, why, yes, of course, and, and whose shoes do you polish? 
That was his response to that man. A servant is one who will take on the humblest jobs, the meanest jobs at times, regardless of what others may think, and fulfill that job with gusto and zeal and maybe even joy, and find joy in that job. We have, you know, recently uh, observed Memorial Day, and sadly, this seems to be one of those holidays that receives very little attention of late. And yet this is an important day in the life of our country, in the life of our nation. For it's a day that we set aside to honor those who gave the supreme sacrifice on the field of battle. It is a day when you and I say thank you to those we have never met. And indeed, much like those airmen of Great Britain. Those we have never met and we are unable to even say thank you to. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 15, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Memorial Day honors the men and the women who have done exactly that, faithful servants in virtually every part of the globe who gave their all. Some were great and famous generals. Others were sailors and soldiers, marines and airmen. But whatever else they, they were, they gave. There's a famous painting from the first World War, and it shows an engineer fixing a, a, a field telephone line along the road. He had just completed the line so that an essential message came through when he was, he was killed. The picture shows him at the moment of death, and beneath it are, there is one word, through, through. That critical message successfully got through the line. This man gave his all, he gave his life, that the message might get through and his comrades in arms would be safe. He too, that lineman, a simple lineman, played his part because he gave to his uttermost. A servant leader shows dedication. Dedication to the task that God has put before him. Determination, I am going to do this to the very best of my ability. Care, concern, love, and compassion. How much we need that in leadership. The world needs servant leaders with these qualifications. Brennan Manning's book, Abba's Child, A Cry of the Heart for Intimate Belonging said, the insistence on the absolute indiscriminate nature of compassion within the kingdom is the dominant perspective of almost all of Jesus' teaching. What is indiscriminate compassion? Take a look at a rose. Take a look at a rose. What a great illustration he has. Is it possible for the rose to say, I'll offer my fragrance to good people, but I'm going to hold it back from bad people? Or can you imagine a lamp that withholds its rays from a wicked person who seeks to walk in the light? It would do that to do that, it would cease being a lamp. It would cease being what it was meant to be, what it was created to be. And observe how helplessly and indiscriminately a tree gives its shade to everyone, good, bad, young, old, high and low. To animals, to God's animal creatures, to humans of every kind and every stripe, and to every other living creature, even to the one who seeks cut down that tree. This is the first quality of compassion, the indiscriminate character. What makes the kingdom come is a heartfelt compassion, a way of tenderness that knows no frontiers or borders, no labor, labels, no compartmentalization, and no sectarian divisions. In the giving of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is teaching us how to pray. In his high priestly prayer, Jesus is praying for us. And at the conclusion of the prayer, Jesus prays that his followers would be one. We so need that one, that call of the psalmist, to dwell together in unity. And sadly, we see that we are not one, and how that must grieve our Lord. In the book of Acts, we read, For God has made of one blood all the nations of the world. All the nations of the world. That is what scripture tells us. It is a unity you see that can be the most effective way of building up servant leaders. Someone reminds us, by going to the cross, Jesus showed that there was nothing that the love of God was not prepared to do 
and to suffer for men. And there was liter literally no limit to it. And we remember those two thieves on the cross. One turns away in anger and, and despair, and the other one turns in humble repentance. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Even there, this criminal at the very last moment of his life turned to him, and Jesus accepted him. There should be no limit to our love as well. And the amazing thing is that that love transforms, and that's what we need today. We need that transformative love all around us. It transforms us from, from merely servants, which we are called to be, to friends, to friends. Jesus said in John 15, I don't call you servants any longer because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. So Jesus is saying, everything I've learned, I'm sharing with you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you ought to go, to go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, the Father will give you. And this is my command, love one another. May we love one another deeper and fuller this day. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that we will truly be the servant leaders that you have called us to be. You have placed us in this divided, hurt, and broken world to make a difference. Help us, O oh God, to make that difference today and always. Amen. Our closing hymn is All Creatures of Our God and King. Thank you for joining us this day. And if you do have any questions, if you have a prayer request, perhaps you have a need, please call our office at 802-442-4599. If you'd like a bulletin, we'd be happy to send you one of those as well. Just leave your name and address and we'll get back in touch with you. And may this week ahead of us be one in which you're blessed and you in turn 
will be a blessing. Let's ask for God's blessing as we depart. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both this day and forevermore, in the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forever. Amen.